Please join me. Mark your Bibles to Acts chapter 26, verses 22 and 23. <clears throat> After you have marked that, turn to Acts chapter 7. We'll be reading verses 57, 58, and then we'll drop down and read chapter in chapter 8, verse 1. <clears throat> It is a great sound to hear them pages turning. Acts chapter 7, verses 57, 58. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran at him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. Acts chapter 8, verse 1. Now Saul was consenting to his death. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Chapter 26, verses 22 and 23. Therefore, having obtained help from God, to this day I stand, witnessing both to small and great, saying no other things than those which the prophets and Moses said would come, that the Christ would suffer, that he would be the first to rise from the dead, and would proclaim light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. Please be seated. Good morning to everyone. We do have one AC unit that is out on this side, so if you're uh, hot, uh, come over to this side. If you're cold, come over to this side. So we should have everybody pleased uh, th this morning with uh, the AC units, but we do have those that are visiting this morning. We are glad that you are here. And if you are visiting, you're, you're our honored guest, and we would ask that you take out an attendance card I need to place it in the collection plate at the end of the service or just hand it to me uh, as you leave today. We would like to have a record of your uh, attendance here and we're glad that you're here. Last night I was very fortunate to be able to spend time with my family watching a movie and uh, we cooked, uh, they cooked some good food, some good vegetables fresh and so uh, we enjoyed that. And today is the Lord's Day, spending with God's family and so we're very thankful for that. There's things in life that stand out. And the Old Testament writer said, I was glad uh, when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And so we should be happy. We should be thankful that it is the Lord's day and that we can come out and worship our Heavenly Father in spirit and in truth. Yeah. What a blessing it is that we can be here. And this morning we want to look at a man by the name of Saul, by the name of Paul, we will go through some of this and see some differences in this man's life. But we're going to see a man really, uh, you could go to two extremes, I suppose. And we will look at that. And whatever changed this man's life will also be able to change our life today if we will simply hear it, believe it, and obey it. And it's not enough just to know the will of God. We must live by the will of God. We read, re, read here when we meet the man, uh, Saul of Tarsus, Acts 17, verses 57 and 58. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young feet, man's feet whose name was Saul. And this is the event where Stephen, a gospel preacher, was put to death because he proclaimed the word of God. And one that was there that day was Saul of Tarsus. Yes, he consented under the death of a gospel preacher. He consented under the death of a man of God. 
And we also notice that Stephen had been condemning these people. He had been condemning the Jews for not accepting Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior as he was. We can gain from that. When we read the, that Stephen was preaching, we can go back to the day of Pentecost when Peter and the other apostles were preaching that every sermon that, pre that was preached was not something that tickled somebody's ears. It was not somebody that made people living in sin feel good. Because if we're living in sin, we should not feel good about it. We should never feel good because we're in sin and somebody that is proclaiming the word of God, we are not here to make people feel good in sin. We are here to show them the word of God, how to come out of sin, that the blood of Jesus Christ may wash away their sins. That's what we are interested in. And we're going to see that as it unfolds in our lesson today. And we also read in Acts 8 verse 1, really a continuation of what we see uh, in, in Acts 7. And it says, and Saul was consenting unto his death. He consented unto the death of a gospel preacher. Yes, this is a good thing that we're doing. Do you realize that Saul of Tarsus, stop and think for a moment, he is serving Satan at this moment. You think, how could a man that becomes an apostle and does as much work what, as what he does, how could he be one that is actually serving Satan? He is, and we have it recorded for us in the word of God. He is consenting, holds the garments while they stone Stephen. You take care of business and I'll take care of your, of your garments, garments while you do so. So he did that and he was persecuting the church. Then we also go further and two verses later, Acts chapter 8 verse 3. And it says, as for Saul, notice this, he made havoc of the church entering into every house. And hailing men and women committed them to prison. He went into people's houses. Those that were Christians, he would find out who they were. He would go in and see where they lived. He would go and help take them to prison because they're serving this Jesus of Nazareth. And Paul, well, what Saul at this time, as he was known, was considering Jesus Christ an imposter. Think about that for a moment. He considers Jesus Christ an imposter. He's not the savior of the world. He's not the one that God has sent. And is it that while they put him on the cross to begin with? They thought he was uh, actually not serving God. They, they accused him of being a liar. Number one, by claiming he's the son of God when, he, when they said that he was not. They accused him also of being a drunk when he was not. Brethren, we learned something there. Just because somebody makes an accusation does not mean that it's true. And so they made accusations against our Lord. And just because they made the accusations certainly did not mean that they're true today. So be careful what you hear about somebody. Be careful even in the body of Christ when somebody says something. Because the standard, the standard is the word of God. The standard is not my feelings. The standard is not what I think. The standard is that we must speak as the oracles of God. 1 Peter 4 verse 11. But now let's read another passage found in Acts chapter 26 beginning in verse 4. And we're going to skip a couple of verses. Verse 4 and 5 and also 9 through 11. Notice what he says here. My manner of life from my youth which was at first among mine own nation of Jerusalem, known of all the Jews, which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify that after the most straightest sect of the, our religion, I lived a Pharisee. He, now, now stop, remember on Wednesday night, we've been discussing a lot about the Pharisees and how they attacked Jesus. Well, guess what we have here? Saul of Tarsus, a Pharisee of the strictest sect. They made laws that... God did not make. They made God, uh, laws that the Lord Jesus Christ did not make. So he was of that, uh, of that sect. I very, barely thought within myself, there's the problem. There's the problem. I thought within myself. Here's how I feel. Here's how I think things should be. 
Stephen, you're not a true preacher of the word of God. Jesus Christ, you're not a true proclaimer of the word of God. You're an imposter. Behold, I thought within myself. Here's how things should be. Brethren, the religious world is turned upside down today because of that. Here's how I feel. We need to go back to the word of God and let it be our guide. We must go back and see what does our Lord want us to do, not what the majority wants us to do. Think for just a moment. You've seen in Bible times, go back to the days of Noah, when they lived and there was only eight people on the ark. Think of where the majority, majority was. They also accused Noah of being a crazy man. You're, you're proclaiming this word a, a flood. We've never seen anything of that nature. But he proclaimed the word of God, and it happened just like he said, said that it would be. And he said, Behold, I thought within myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of my saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priest. Now notice, there's the religious leaders of the day. You've got the Pharisees. Now you've got the chief priest. Where did this authority that Paul was exercising come from? Was it from the Lord or Saul of Tarsus, I, if, you, uh, if, I, if I misstated that? Where did his authority come from? It did not come from God. It came from the chief priests, religious leaders of the day. Notice, brethren, very important. Just simply being religious was not enough to save people. They were religiously wrong, the chief priest. Saul of Tarsus was religiously wrong in what he, what he was doing. He sought to do many things, and when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them, and I punished them oft in every synagogue and compelled them to, be, to blaspheme, and being exceedingly uh, mad against them, I persecuted them even in strange cities. He was diligent in what he did. He went into the synagogues. He knew when they would be meeting. He knew what day they would be there. And he went in there and found them and people that were following the Lord. I'm looking for you. I'm going to put you in prison. Some of you may die. Question, would we still be willing to follow the Lord if that's what was required of us today? If we had to follow the Lord and it cost us our life. If somebody says, if you're going to believe in this Jesus, if you're going to follow Jesus... You're going to be put in prison. Would you still want to be a Christian? If you're going to follow Jesus, you're going to be put to death. Would you still want to be a Christian? Saul of Tarsus was persecuting, very diligently persecuting the church. But we're going to see some things different about him in just a few moments. And he also said in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13, I was before, now notice before, here's what I used to be. He's wise enough. He's honest enough to take a look at himself. You know, so often, people are not honest enough to take a look at themselves. Hey, what I'm doing is okay, and I'm going to stay here. You have nothing to lose by looking at the Bible compared to your life, do you? That includes the preacher. That includes every one of us, doesn't it? We need to take a look at our life. Is what I'm doing, the way that I'm living, the way that I'm worshiping, does it line up with the word of God or does it line up more with the, the word of, of, of men? But he was a blasphemer and a per persecutor and injurious. He hurt people for being Christians and the whole time he thought he was serving God. What about us? Is there times that we think that we're serving God when in reality we're not? That's not what God would have us to do. We need to take an honest look at ourselves because we meet so many people. You've met some of them. I've met many of them. Well, you know, I, I, don't, I don't go to church services. I, um, I don't really do this and that. But, hey, I, I live a good moral life. I, I, don't hurt, I don't hurt anybody like Saul of Tarsus was doing. You know, I even help some people now and then. There was somebody down the street recently needed help. Their house burned down, and, and I was there to help them right away. Those things are good. But it won't save you. I want you to stop and reason for a moment. If simply being good was enough to save us, 
Jesus Christ will not have need come and out on the cross. Just be good and you'll be saved. What about the household of Cornelius? He was a devout man, Acts chapter 10. He gave much alms. He gave much money to, to help the people. A religious man, a good man, and still lost until he obeyed the word of God. And the same is true with us. Not just being good, not just believing in God, we must submit to God. In Galatians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, Paul writes this. For you have heard of my, co my co conversion in time past, of the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it and profited in the Jews' religion above any equals in my own religion, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. Now, Saul, there's one of your problems. You walked in the traditions of your fathers. We need to be walking in the paths of God. We need to be doing what God says. Whatever God says, that's what I'm going to do. We're going to see a man that's going to make a, a great change here. We have one more verse, 1 Timothy 1, verse 15. Paul called himself the chief of sinners. Think about that for a moment. He realized the life that I was living. Yes, I was diligent. Yes, I was religious. I went into synagogues. I went into houses. I helped put people to death. I put Christians in prison. I wouldn't let them rest. I wouldn't let them have any peace. This religious man is going to make a change. Here's what we need to look at in our lives. Do we need to make a change? Now, there's two aspects of making a change. Sometimes it's been in becoming a Christian to begin with. Some people, like Saul, thought they were doing right. And in essence, they find out they're not doing what is right. Some people, even though they have become children of God, they're not zealous. Remember, Saul of Tarsus, you can give him credit for one thing. He was a zealous man. And that's something that we learn we must be zealous for the cause of God, not being content and just being, well, I'm a member. You know, my name is written in the directory, for we want our name written is in the Lamb's Book of Life. That's what matters, not what some directory says. The directory can't save you. Man can't save you, but the Lord can. The Lord can save you if you'll serve him. Reread this now. We're going to see a change that takes place. And whatever changed this man will also change us. We notice beginning in the book of Acts chapter 26 verses 22 and 23. Having therefore obtained help of God. He's gone to the right source now. He's gone to where he can truly find the help. I can find help of God. He says, I continue unto this day witnessing both to great and to, and to small, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come, that Christ should suffer, and that he should be the first that should be uh, rise from the dead, and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. Now this Jesus, whom he was persecuting, now he's proclaiming. That's a drastic change, isn't it? This chief of sinners has made a change. This man that was a Pharisee and diligent above what his countrymen were doing, of the strictest sect, he's made a change. How did he do that? By God's help. You ever seen anybody says, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come and give my life to God when I get my life in order. You ever seen anybody do that? I know of somebody that did that. And you have to explain to them, how are you going to get your life in order until you give it to God? Amen. It's an impossibility. We must follow God first. That's what Saul of Tarsus did. Now I'm giving it to God rather than my fathers and my countrymen. Just what your countrymen say, they can't save you. you know, I had parents, and some of them served God. Some of them didn't serve God. I had grandparents. Some of them served God, some of them didn't serve God. So I can't depend upon what man says. I must depend upon what does the word of God say. I must know what the Bible says, and here's the problem that we have. There's a famine in the land. There's a famine in America. 
Yes, in America, we can pick up a Bible at any time that we want. You can go to your computer, go to Amazon or other sites. You can have a Bible at your house in two or three days. But the problem is we're not studying the Word of God. We don't know the Word of God in the land. And also, I'm afraid there's a famine in the body of Christ sometimes. We don't know what the word of God is, and therefore we're not living by the word of God. Brethren, we should be going out and meeting people and introducing them, the body of Christ. One thing I wanted to mention to you, there's a few of them still in the back, some house to house. And on it, it has about our vacation Bible school. I've given out several the last few days, and uh, I, I usually get my prescriptions, or most of them at least, and uh, Walgreens and Muro. I gave out one to the pharmacist and the two young ladies that work there. And, you know, once you deal with people, you know, a number of times, you get to know them pretty well. And if I can talk to them about other things, I can talk to them about, um, about religious things. They, you know, hey, I got something for you. Well, the pharmacist came over, and one thing, they turned the page. And I, I don't know if you've seen this one, but I can give you this one. Uh, Brother Webster does a great job with house to house to begin with. Give him credit for that. But they have some things in there, a little bit more on the lighter side, along with some things that are uh, very serious, of course. But one of the things, I, and I could hear them, the pharmacists and the, uh, the people that work with them talking about and, and laughing about. There's a little paragraph in there. It says, Father talking to son. Father says to son, when, when Lincoln was your, your age, he was making a living for himself. Son says back to the father, yeah, and when he was your age, he was president of the United States. I, I could hear them talking about that and laughing in the back. You know, there's actually a moral to that story, isn't there? Be careful about judging. There, there's actually a moral to that story. But also by putting those lighter things in there, I think it gets people's attention a little bit. And yesterday, uh, me and Jess has uh, gone uh, headlong into planting plants and things, and we'd stopped up to this place uh, right beside Chase Bank there, for, forget the name of it and gave one to the lady, I'd ask her a question. We were looking for something they're actually going to get for us. And um, my hometown, you, some of you may remember, uh, Warren County, Tennessee, McMinnville, Tennessee, is the nursery capital of the world. So I thought, well, I want to ask her a question. Have you ever bought anything from there? And they had indeed. So uh, you, make a, you make a connection. And then uh, since they're ordering something, I, well, here's my number. What happens to be on the house to house? They read the same paragraph. People laugh about that. And you make a connection. Brethren, as children of God, we need to be making a connection with the, with the people in this world. There's still people out there that want the gospel. Yes, we do live in a difficult area. But what would you think if the Apostle Paul lived here and he was a member of the Shalmet congregation? To start with, I'd let him preach any time he wanted to preach. But I, you know, I'd sit back and listen. But what do you think he'd be doing? Do you think he would be busy going through our community trying to meet people? Do you think he would be busy trying to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ in our community? Or do you think he'd just say, well, there's not much you can do here. You know, you just can't help people here. I don't believe that would be a Paul's attitude to you. Uh, we actually know it wouldn't be. Brethren, we ought to be busy spreading the word of God. We also read in 2 Corinthians 11, 22 through 28. It says, are they, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they the ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more, in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck in the, a night and a day. I have been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils of the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. There's what Paul would be doing. 
He suffered. Why? For the cause of Christ. He knew that it would save man's soul. First, he knew that it saved his soul, didn't it? This morning, have you been saved by obeying the word of God? Not the word of men. This man standing before you can't save you. No man can save you. The Lord can save you when you submit to him. And only when you submit to him can and will he save you. Just like Saul of Tarsus, oh, Paul the Apostle, was also saved. We read 2 Timothy 1 verse 15. This thou knowest, that all that are in Asia turned away from me. Paul was left by his own people. They turned away from him. You know, we have a pretty good number set in here. Can you imagine that you're doing what you're supposed to, to be doing and everybody here turned away from you? That, that'd be hard, wouldn't it? Would you quit? Paul didn't. Paul kept on proclaiming the word of God. Brethren, that's what we need to be doing. Proclaiming the word of God. And then we also see in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give of me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all of them that love his appearing. Paul knew that the time that he was about to die was getting close. He was ready. Now he knew that if he stayed in, in this world, he was going to be busy doing the work of, of the Lord. He knew if he died that it was better, he goes on to a better place. Brethren, while we're here, we ought to be busy spreading the word of God. We ought to be busy studying the word of God and applying it to our lives. We have a world that you walk around that is lost in sin, and it needs the help of God. The only light is God's people, isn't it? So we have to be out there and letting the light of God shine in our lives. And then we read also Acts 7, verse 60. This is the verse of uh, a verse about Stephen, actually, going back to him. After what they, were, what they were doing, they were putting him to death. Some of his last words were, lay not this sin to their, their charge. Could you do that? Could I do that? They're about to kill me. I'm being put to death. Lord, don't lay this to their charge. Sounds like the words of Jesus, doesn't it? Then we also see in 1 Timothy 4, verse 16, may it not be laid to their account. Oh, that's the Apostle Paul. We have Jesus. We have Stephen. We have the Apostle Paul that lived such lives that even when people were cruel to them, they kept on doing what was right, and they even said, God, don't lay this to their charge. They were truly dedicated servants of God, weren't they? What about us? We need to do the same thing. And then we read in Philippians 1.12, But I would, ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather under the furtherance of the gospel. We've got a VBS coming up. And we're, we're going to be knocking on, on, on doors. We're going to be talking to people about the gospel. An, an opportunity lies before us. Brethren, let us rise up to the occasion. Let us rise up and build. Tonight, we've got something that leads to that by preparing our material. Let us rise up and build. Let us spread the word of God. I've got some in this audience. I'm not going to name them. They've been working on some people. They've been planting the seed. And they've asked me to help water. We know that God will give the increase. Brethren, I can say there's things people do behind the scenes that you don't always see. So don't think people are not working. They are. Let's just make sure that we're helping all that we can by being what God wants us to be. And the last passage I want to read is Galatians 3, verses 27 through 29. Paul says, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, did put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. 
And if ye be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What about us? Have we been washed in the blood of Christ? That's the, in that passage, he tells us that we're baptized into Christ. You know, the spiritual blessings, all of them are, are in Christ. Salvation is, is a spiritual blessing. It's in Christ. So we have to be baptized in order to gain those spiritual blessings. We have to be baptized in order to be saved. Now, sometimes people are baptized and they, they say, well, it shows I was already saved. That's not what he said, though, is it? So some people have to be baptized according to the will of God. There's something, and this I want to give credit to James Boyd and some of these notes. Um, don't blame everything that I said on him, but uh, uh, I want to give credit, but there's a point I want to make here, and a very valid point that he makes, and James Boyd's the father of Bill Boyd that held our meeting. But uh, Brother James Boyd, it's hard for me to I call Bill Bill, but I can't call him. I had to call him Brother Boyd. But anyway, years, many years ago, uh, he went to Freed Hardham. It might not have even been college at that time. But he went to college with a man that was served under Hitler uh, and, and his regime. And so when the war was over, the Germans lost, you know, you know, just a little bit about history. He was back in Frankfurt, Germany. He lost everything that he had and serving under Hitler, uh, nobody wants anything to do with you now. You're, you, know, you know how they felt about the, those people. Well, there was a man, the first missionary there, one of our brothers in Christ, a man by the name of Otis Gatewood, he taught the man the gospel. That man was baptized into Christ, just like we just read about. That man went to college with Brother Boyd, went back to Germany and proclaimed the word of God as a gospel preacher. That's changing your life, isn't it? it you saw how it changed Saul of Tarsus. Here's a man that served under Hitler's regime had nothing left when it was all over, but became a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's power in the word, isn't there? Rather than obey the word of God. This morning, if you have not been baptized into Christ, would you do that? If you are a child of God, are you serving fervently with all your heart? There is a verse in a song that we, well, first we see in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 25, it says, the word liveth and abideth forever. Brethren, the word does that for us. But a passage, a, a verse in a song says, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Are we doing that with our lives? Giving it completely to the Lord. If we can't serve God with conditions. God, I'm serving you, but here's my condition. No, we must serve God on his conditions. See, he's the one that gives the rules. He's the one that makes the, uh, tell, gives the commandments. This morning, if you're not a child of God, or if you need to correct something in your life, or simply need prayers for strength, the word of God serves its purpose. Will you come as we stand and as we sing? <laughs>